My name is Carl Myrtle. I'm with the uh, Lexmark and Perceptive Software. I'm the Executive Vice President of Perceptive Software. Down in South Africa, we think there's a lot of opportunity here uh, to be able to assist corporations in dealing with unstructured data, which we believe is a big problem today. Excellent. Good stuff. Thank you. Well, let, let's start with unstructured data as a problem because it clearly is a very big problem and it's, it's one that we saw coming, if you like. People have been talking about um, getting a, a handle on unstructured data for a while, but clearly they haven't been very good at it. And we've, we've now got a lot of the database guys looking at ways to try to categorize and, and and manage the, all that unstructured data. But you're, t you're looking at it from a, a business process point of view rather than from a technology point of view, I guess. All the examples you showed were people who have business problems arising from unmanaged unstructured data. Is that about right? I think that's accurate. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, there hasn't been a lot of leadership in the field and there hasn't been technology until, until this came along, I believe, that's able to absorb and ingest the unstructured data in a meaningful way. And so it's one thing to talk about classifying or building databases that are smarter or wiser. It's far different when you start to think about uh, society as a whole and how it, it, it ebbs and tides and uh, you know, nomenclature changes and people's understanding of things changes. We need to be able to get information into the system so we can make better informed decisions and at the same time access those systems notwithstanding how information has been indexed. Right. Looking at it from a, from a technological point of view, quite often the focus is, is driven by infrastructure, it's driven by, uh, by cost savings or by sort of a geek need to, to simplify structures. Uh, the impression I got from listening to the examples that you were giving earlier was very much a focus on addressing business issues. Uh, and in many cases, it seems like the, the customers you were talking to weren't fully aware of just how deep an overhead they were incurring. I think that's accurate. I mean. It's very simple to look, for example, at a back office operation and just view it as a cost center. Right. And uh, it's easy for a lot of people to come along. There are BPOs and others who have tried to capture the cost containment, if you will. I think you need to go beyond that because assuming you do everything purpose, purposeful and it's meaningful, at the end of the day, if you're doing it exactly the same year after year, you're still going to have an increase in cost. Labor is always on the uptick. Uh, getting information in and the amount of information you can get is on uptick. So uh, having technology that's able to be deployed and deployed in a way that's meaningful and delivering results I think is, is, is hugely valuable. What tends to drive the, the engagement from the customers that, that, that you talk to? Is there enough of an awareness from, from their side that they do have a problem that something needs to be done? Uh, what, what I'm getting at is, is is whether, you know, is how the, the problem accrues to such a degree. You know, these processes have been in place for years. Well, it manifests itself in pain, right. right? I mean, at the end of the day, the reason we like to talk to uh, individuals in the C-suite is because when you ask them what their big pain points are, they almost invariably come back to data integrity, comes back to the ability to get my hands on information so I can make meaningful decisions, and that all lies with the fact that they're looking at a very small subset of data available to them. The structured data we know is reported to be about 15 to 20 percent of what we have out there. Well, that's, that's a small microcosm of what's actually coming into organizations today. And if you're making decisions on a you know, very, very narrow focus, the resultant is that you're not getting a big holistic view. And uh, the supposition becomes very obvious to them. They don't always see it for that purpose. What they say is, I have this pain. And as you peel the onion back, you begin to understand it all ties back to the fact they don't have the unstructured data in the system. Right. The people who put it in made mistakes. They weren't able to get it in in a timely manner to make an informed decision. Uh, they, they made duplicate payments, as an example, in the invoice world. Uh, they couldn't get their orders processed fast enough. They couldn't, uh, they're having impacts to cash flow. It, 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 it really affects the wide range of uh, an organization's infrastructure. Is compliance a big driver here? You mentioned a, a banking customer who had a very high rate of non-compliance with, with opening accounts. Absolutely. It's, a, it's probably uh, one of the things that's at the forefront today, particularly in highly regulated industries. Uh, becoming compliant, and particularly in a time when uh, the economies have not been uh, particularly good, regulators tend to sort of tighten their, their grip, and I think uh, th that's always a challenge for institutions because compliance is a cost. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily yield additional revenue. Right. So what we're talking about is giving them two, hits, two bites at the apple, right? We're, we're going to do this in a way 
so that you're going to be compliant. And we're also going to remove all those people who in the past were doing something that's very mundane to be compliant and not doing a very good job at that, and make them available to you to deploy elsewhere in your organization for higher level tasks, uh, you know, working perhaps in a sales role or whatever it might be in the organization. Right. Now, we've been talking about, as an IT industry, about the paperless office for as long as I can remember. Um, and clearly that's, that's never happened. If anything, things have got progressively worse. The impression I get from, from hearing you talk is that there should instead have been a focus on a paperless process. I think that's right. I, don't, I, I think uh, you heard it today from one of our customers. The idea that uh, paper is going away, I think, is uh, far-fetched. But if I look across an organization at the various processes that they've deployed, to the extent paper, and by the way, keep in mind, this solution is not limited to paper. It works with digital Im images as well, or, or digital feed, uh, that might be uh, coming into your email box. Uh, you might have complaint letters coming into your organization. I need to be able to look at the document, contextually determine what it is, and make sure that gets routed to the right person in the organization. So it's, it's uh, I think it's uh, re really changed, uh, it's, it's changing the way people think about it. Right, with a focus on the process rather no than, question. than on the no. data or the source material. No question. It's uh, look at the process, if it's paper intensive or you've got uh, digital information that's coming in of an unstructured nature, focus on streamlining that so the, that you can redeploy resources or, or get resources focused on things that are growing your business, not, uh, not simply supporting uh, some type of back office function or supporting some type of compliance right. requirement. What's normally the role within the organization that identifies the problem to start with? Is it generally a, a CFO type who, who wants to, because then we're back to a cost containment question, uh, but who, who is normally the kind of person who would be identifying the process with a problem and looking for a solution? So I'll be real honest with you, we're, we're helping them discover that when we go in and meet with them. And uh, we meet uh, and sell primarily to CFOs, CEOs and CIOs. So that is our target. And the reason I, I like to talk to them is because they understand at a business level where the pain is. So I mentioned earlier, uh, Siemens is one of our customers, and they use it in a global shared service center. Their challenge is getting adoption by all of their various operating entities to use the shared service center. So their challenge is we need to make sure we're processing quickly enough that we are as good as it was when they were operating independent of the shared service center. Well, that's his challenge. And if you back up from that, you realize, well, that's all a function of being able to get the data in so he can actually process things and make things happen as quickly as they did before. Right. That's about being able to ingest that unstructured data very quickly. Right. So I like to go to senior level people in the organization because they're looking at it from a very different perspective than maybe some down, down in the weeds. Who may not be able to see the wood for the trees. They exactly, just, no they, question. They do the process every day. They don't right. necessarily see it from that bird's eye view. No question. Now, having said that, we do spend time talking with people who are the worker bees, the people's in the trenches, because we really want to understand when the rubber meets the road exactly what's going on in that process. But uh, it manifests itself at a broader level at the C-suite because they start to see it for the problem that's coming out of it, not uh, necessarily the, the, the uh, steps in the process. Right. What's the, what's the next step? A lot of the examples you gave were sort of ended at the, sort of the point of deployment where they, they've realized some benefits, they've reduced headcount, or they've improved accuracy and turnout and so on. But then what? what, 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 what oh, well, where the, do people go that from there? Oh, the, the, there, there is not an insight for that. It's endless numbers. I mean, we're working with some of the largest banks in the world, and they've literally, after having made their first deployment, they've put what I'll call evangelists, who are going through the organization systematically finding other processes that are very manual, that are operating in a fashion that's not productive right. and, and deploying this technology in those various arenas. Keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, this is a tool that is both document agnostic and language agnostic. So again, uh, we, I wouldn't start with a, a global enterprise deployment uh, of every problem you have in a business. We start in one department with one specific issue and resolve it. But because it's a single platform and that platform can extend across the organization, the capabilities certainly exist to do any number. And we see customers who do that. They bring on one and then the next and then the next. Now I'm speaking here today ostensibly about capture, but as you saw in the presentation, we also have the capability of providing you complete business process management. We have the ability to provide you enterprise content management. 
So where those customers or prospects out there have not invested in something already, we have that. If you have invested, the tool works likewise with a document, a file net, an ERP system, SAP, Oracle, or whatever you might have. Right. And then on the back end, it's about accessing the data. So it's not only the data that I'm bringing into the system, but it's data that sits in all these legacy repositories that are out there, many of which have been indexed in a myriad of different ways. And the whole concept is about giving the, the, uh, the user, if you will, a holistic view. Let's take a financial institution. I, I, I rarely walk into a financial institution where if I ask them, can you, can you push a button on your computer and pull up a customer name and find out everything that they're doing with you in mortgages and everything they're doing with you in checking and everything they're doing with you in savings, they almost invariably don't have that capability. They have it, but they have to go into different silos. They use different types of searching among those silos. The nomenclature that's been used in the archiving originally from an indexing perspective is different from one silo to the next. I was recently with a company in Australia, and they had a, a, a whole array of archives. It's a very large insurance company, and they have one where they told me they're, they're, they have the last two people on the face of the planet that can actually access it. Uh, That's pretty dangerous, I would suggest. Uh, yeah. So we're talking about a tool that can, you can leverage across that, right. and be able to look at those disparate repositories and present yourself something back that's holistic, that gives you a full range and view. Now, obviously, at, at the high end, the, the very large global organizations with, with lots of processes and enormous amounts of data, there's tremendous scope for, for solving the problem. But how far down the food chain does it come? What sort of size companies should be looking at this? Or is there a point where companies are, are maybe just too small or don't have the kind of processes that would suit investigating a solution like yeah, I think it depends on uh, which of the three pieces, capture, manager, access, that you're talking about. In the capture space, you're right, uh, we tend to want environments where they have, uh, you know, greater than eight or ten people doing some type of manual process. Uh, we want them processing, uh, you know, north of 500 to 1,000 pages a day. So that's sort of a threshold. Sometimes they can have suboptimal processes that need to be fixed. It doesn't really matter what the size is in terms of company. Uh, on the enterprise content management and business process management, I don't think it matters what the size of the company is. They all, everyone needs that type of technology for purposes of archiving and routing around digital information through your organization, making sure you understand the process flow and so forth. And lastly, I think the searching uh, capability, the accessing capability is likewise um, applicable at the full range of customers because it doesn't matter how big or small you are, you still need the information. Right. Uh, one of the things I would actually give you as an illustration is we work with some law firms, for example. And uh, oftentimes you'll have a big law firm and uh, representing one side of the litigation and a small law firm representing the other side. This tool is a real leveling of the playing field because where in the past I might have not have had the bodies in a small firm to throw at uh, really working on it, here the information becomes readily available to me. Mm. And that's a case, I suppose, where the, the business process is, is so clearly identifiable as core to their business. Right, exactly. Okay. Now, lots of interest at the moment in cloud services, software as a service. Does that change the landscape? It yeah. does. It does. And I think that's where you're able to go down even further, uh, meaning going into the, 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 the small and medium-sized businesses. And the, of course the challenge is that they want to have that IT infrastructure in the cloud and not have it in their facilities. And we have uh, tools that do that. We're able to offer those solutions to them. And uh, one of the issues that you will see sometimes is they don't have a workflow. They haven't invested in some of those types of things. So we're working diligently to bring up every one of our offerings inside that uh, cloud right. perspective. Today, uh, if customers are desirous of doing the Alpha to Omega, we're, we are very aggressive with them in terms of pricing it out in an operating model, which essentially operates the same, same way, although they would be on premises. Right, right, gotcha. Are, are there regional differences what you, when you're looking at customers? Are there sort of identifiable business practices that you would see in South Africa versus in the US or Europe or Australia? Oh, they vary geo by geo. Every geo is unique and has a unique set of requirements. Um, I, I just I mentioned earlier, I just come back from China and uh, as advanced as China is in many respects, some of the largest institutions in the world there, um, they are doing things almost of a, a prehistoric nature. 
it's, 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 it's really uh, mind-boggling to think. I went with one bank, for example, they're hiring 4,000 people a year just to handle the data entry of back office. That's how fast they're growing. 4,000 additional people per year. So in, in their environment, they have a different set of challenges. Uh, I mentioned in the presentation, they have a lot of stamps that are used for purposes of approval. And that creates and, and can oftentimes wreak havoc in a traditional OCR environment. So uh, we see that as being a, a difference. Uh, you heard the gentleman speak uh, from one of our customers and talk about some of the regulatory requirements within South Africa with respect to how you process invoices, understanding whether they could keep a digital image as opposed to a paper image and so forth. And so I think you do have to be mindful where you go, whether we're processing in Brazil where they have a myriad of VAT taxes that run across the specter, or you're in Wisconsin, or you're down in Australia, each one of those has their own set of challenges. The beauty, again, and the reason I get so uh, excited and passionate about what we're doing here is that this is a technology that is truly document agnostic in language. The science, this is not a typical application development. There's actually a plethora of mathematical algorithms that sit beneath, and we have a whole uh, team of scientists, PhD scientists on staff, who that's all they do is build these algorithms so that we can drive accuracy uh, in the pattern matching and in the neural networks that are used to drive the solution. Right, right. How, how is that developed? Because obviously as your customer base grows, you presumably get more and more feedback from what's no happening in, in the field. I mean, is that accelerating the, the rate of development? And the next thing I'm going to ask you is, where are you developing? What's, what's well, coming down the pipe? Uh, first off, let me say, we absolutely uh, regard not only feedback from the customers and our partners as critical, we feed that right back into our development organization and our product management team, and we take it very seriously. Uh, I will give you some, some late, latest things on the horizon. We see higher education, for example, being an area where there's significant play. As students migrate from one university to another, one of the, th the challenges is that universities need to ingest all of the transcripts from the preceding university. They need to reconcile how that course complies with the course that they might have so they can adjust the credits that the student might have. Using the same technology, we've deployed that now uh, across transcripts, as an example. Right. We're using it for bills of lading. We're using it for order entry. I have one customer who processes um, coupons that they receive um, for um, styrofoam containers that they sell out through distributors. And when those, those styrofoam containers are sold at certain rates, they're entitled to get rebates of money. They had over $100 million in working capital tied up. Deploying this solution, they were able to free up that working capital instantly, make sure that that information made its way into the appropriate system so that payments could get made. And uh, it, so it's, it, again, it's, it's completely agnostic. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's ARAP, orders, uh, healthcare. In the U.S., we have huge amounts of explanation of benefits. So EOBs coming into a hospital that might have multiple patients' information on it. You can imagine, imagine the security protocols that are involved in that. This technology is able to lift that data, feed it to their system, reconcile so they can send the bill out for the balance that might be due that the insurance didn't pay. Any number of documents. Okay, and the last area I'd like to touch on really is just the, in the last few years, this incredible rise of mobility, smartphones, tablet computing. How has that changed the way that your customers are working and the way that they're interacting with, with your solutions? Oh, there's no question. It, it's, it's front of mind, and I think it has to be for anybody who's serious in the enterprise software business. Customers want to be able to uh, ingest data. You could literally take a an iPhone today and take a six megapixel picture of a document, have data lifted from it, kick off a workflow, process and a payment can occur out the back side and it's happening in uh, you know, sub-seconds. Right. Right. And so you've got to be able to have every possible medium for input and on the back side I need to have every possible medium for being able to find data. Right. And uh, as we think about it, it really is about being able to capture that data no matter what unit I'm using. Lexmark sells multifunctional devices. You might have an iPad, an iPhone, a laptop. It doesn't matter. I need to be able to get that data in through whatever means I have. I need to be able to manage that data in my core systems that I have. And I need to be able to access it on the back side. And so I used a PC to put it in, but I want to access it on my iPhone an hour later. Right. There must be a fairly clear correlation here now as more and more organizations start to manage their processes better between competitive advantage or being competitive at all and the efficiency of your processes? 
Uh, well, I think you mean for the end user. Well, no, I mean, I mean for your for your customers. So if you take a look at your banking customers, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned a, a Chinese bank losing business because they were you know, slow, right. slow to capture data. A uh, fairly clear link there between their ability to remain competitive. No, I, I don't. I don't think there's any question, and that's why I don't think you can look at it only as a cost containment issue. I think yeah. you have to look at it in terms of what is what is holding up my business. Can I grow? How creative can I be? And look at the solutions that drive that. And not only look at it to say, well, I can take 10 people out or 100 people out of an organization. It may be that you don't have 100 people doing data entry, but you've got 100 more people that feed on the street actually out selling. You've just moved the dollars around in the organization, but those dollars become productive to the unit as a whole. It was a nice example you gave with an organization which translated the, you know, the, the dollar value into the revenue they had to produce That's right. to get that same value. Which That's like right. A, quite a, quite a, a good way to look at it. I think it is because uh, oftentimes we look at that cost containment. We say we saved money, and I always joke with people. I, I, I think that's a sort of old adage to say, "I'm here. We're here I'm going to save you money, make you efficient, streamline your enterprise." Uh, it reminds me of my wife. My wife comes in after she's been shopping. She says, "Look at all the things I bought. You know, I've saved you money." Well, she hasn't saved me anything. It's cost me money. And so I think when, when you look at businesses and you say, okay, this is the savings, the real question you have to ask yourself is, what's the widget that they're selling? Are they selling donuts? Are, are they a retailer? Is it a bank that's lending money? You know, what is it that they do for a living? And understanding what amount of pain they'd had to go through to generate that much revenue for what drops to the bottom line. Right. By the way, understand, this is money sitting there today that they can capture. So the reason that I'm, you know, very bullish about this type of technology is not only are we light years ahead of our competition, and I don't see that window closing as rapidly as you would typically see in technology. Having said that, we invest very heavily in R&D and we continue to always try to improve. I do think that the, the, the customers as a whole, every time we go in, they are uh, very enamored with the fact that if you look at it in its incarnation, when they deploy, they get the savings, and if they think about how much they'd have to have spent to generate that same revenue for what they ultimately save, uh, it's, it's almost staggering. Excellent.